Good evening. Welcome to Diversa TV, season, season four, second to last show. Wow, what a long, wonderful trip it's been. I'm Mark Harris, your host, and uh, I'll introduce our guest in just a second. If you are just uh, tuning in to Diversa TV, welcome. If you are a continuing viewer, welcome back. Um, Diversa TV's mission, if you could go to Slide Gents, thanks, is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. To that end, uh, we our schedule, which roughly corresponds with the LCC terms, uh, though we take off for summer, so I apologize or uh, emphasize that you can watch during the summer, but it will be in reruns. We won't be doing live shows. Uh, on Wednesday nights, these shows are live, and on subsequent nights during the week, there are reruns of that week's offerings. So where we've gone, as we usually do, uh, we start out with a native perspective, Anglo, Africans in America, Latino, hip-hop. So again, diversity TV isn't, isn't necessarily about ethnicity, uh, but though we do tend to concentrate on the folks that we don't necessarily see with, uh, on television or give the mic to. Uh, GLBTQ squared IT2S, which is gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer questioning, intersex, transgendered, two-spirit, all those different labels. And uh, disability, last a month, last week, uh, May 28th, this, uh, tonight we're doing a youth perspective, and June 11th, uh, we'll look at class perspective, uh, looking at the uh, Red Lodge program out of Portland, which deals with uh, Native Americans transitioning out of uh, prison into the larger community. Uh, as a way of introducing, uh, a number of us, if you caught my uh, op-ed piece in the weekly talking about being a mandatory reporter where the lead line was, I'm a mandatory reporter for a system that I would not trust a single blood relative to. And while I was speaking specifically about the alcohol and drug system, uh, mostly in Lane County, though that definitely applies to the state largely. Um, there are other uh, sources of, shall we say, pattern neglect as we talk about in the literature. So in terms of another, uh, another colleague of mine who uh, was also writing uh, another uh, op-ed that I got an early draft of, and I'm quoting uh, her from this, uh, so that's what this is. If you go to slide for a second. I, a former high school principal, witnessed Eugene police officers on a few occasions take pictures of the severe harm parents inflicted on my students, their children, only to hear services to children and families workers, now known as DHS, Department of Human Services. Uh, services to children and families workers tell me more than once Quote, they can leave home and live on the streets as a viable option for youth too young to gain employment. So in other words, essentially they weren't actually going to intervene uh, and remove an abused teenager from the home and basically the system's response was essentially, a, you know, oh, well, they can live on the street. And so if we go back to the slide again, this, of course, was without helping them learn to survive on the streets, like giving them instructions on how you do that, as if a state agency would do that. But, you know, if that is the recommendation, then, and you weren't learned, you know, if your family structure broke down and wasn't able to take care of you, your alternative is basically to be a homeless youth, and you're telling people that. So this is, of course, without helping them learn to survive on the streets or in an abusive family. To me, it was a thinly veiled institutional invitation for a young person to be sexually abused on the street to survive as a result of policies by the state. Lack of services for abused young people who are much more likely to be disenfranchised youth in this town, a system to be homeless teaches them the lessons of neglect rather than they are important enough to gain a safe haven to escape from abuse, which is society's proper role. So when we talk about falling through the cracks, you know, the official term, uh, at least in Lane County, was uh, going back uh, 
easily into the mid 80s we call them level seven kids and basically the state acknowledged that they are in dire need that these kids are in dire need of services and also acknowledges it will not intervene because of lack of resources to do so basically choosing to focus on infants and small children who are sexually abused but not to intervene on the part of anyone 13 or older uh, because, oh, we don't have enough foster care for them or whatever the reason is that they give, if they give a reason. In fact, telling them you can be homeless on the street. So the cracks are essentially by design. So people are falling through the cracks, and our guest tonight has survived that. And uh, I may introduce Lotus Brashears. Welcome. Hello. Thank you for having me. Sure. So actually, uh, focus this way because the, the cam angles actually work, you know, as if we're having a, con a real conversation. So where are you from and uh, where did you grow up? Well, I often have a very long answer to uh, that question when people ask me. I grew up essentially in a van. Um, sometimes we lived at a house for short periods of time. However, we were always traveling and always on the, the move. Um, I lived, I say mainly, in Washington, Oregon, California, Texas, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, Arkansas. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> Grow up in a van in the south, the west. But we, yeah. we traveled around, and what my family did was um, my dad played the banjo on the street for a living and my mom would play the wash tub bass and I played my fiddle okay. sometimes and I did different street acts and I sang songs with them and we were um, street performers and we just made our living and uh, by busking on the street well, you know okay. and I, I came to Eugene when I was 10 years old I uh, called up my grandma who was living in Mackenzie Bridge and I asked her if I could come live with her. And um, why then? At the time, I uh, had a broken leg, and I had just recently gotten my cast off, taken off. And um, I tried to stay with some family down in Southern California, but th I was not allowed to stay there any longer. And um, I was going to go homeless or I was going to start staying with my mother living in her truck. So instead I uh, decided to reach out and talk to a grandparent that I wasn't very much um, in contact even with, um, but definitely asked her a big favor and uh, she said yeah. And uh, I stayed with her there in Mackenzie Bridge for a while and after my mother um, got on her feet again um, she decided to follow me up to Oregon and decided Eugene was a, a neat, neat sounding kind of town. She heard lots of good things about Eugene and um, so she just packed everything up in a truck and came to Eugene. And you were living with your grandma in Mackenzie Bridge. Mm -hmm. So at times, I mean, in the, the conversation that we had, you know, um, you know, earlier in the week, you know, at times having to essentially raise yourself, what, what did you have to do? Um, at a very young age, I started taking on responsibilities um, that I didn't even think were unusual for somebody my age to mm -hmm. be taking on. Um, at a very young age, I understood when I was hurt, I never went to go ask for help. I, um, I remember really young, like even three or four years old, um, finding the hydrogen peroxide myself and disinfecting my wounds and putting Neosporin on it and a Band-Aid. Hmm. Um, I think that I always had a very good understanding of how um, able my parents were at the time. And when I was four years old, my brother was born, and I think I immediately started taking on that um, responsibility as well. I definitely raised my brother um, in some senses. Um, you know, things like um, collecting the checks that would come in the mail from my mother 
and cashing them in order to pay the bills um, at, at very young age. What age? Probably nine or ten, yeah. I would say, yeah. ten. Okay. Doing what you have to do. Mm -hmm. So exactly. Okay. Taking care of my brother always, okay. you know. I, when he was a baby, I would change his diaper, feed him, or whatnot. But um, I also started babysitting at a really young age and started making money. Um, you know, if we were if we were staying in a town for a little bit of time. Hmm. But uh, you know, it so was always. So all this is like during you know traveling and mm -hmm. you know, various the, the states that you named, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, Okay, I could see Neosporin on cuts, right? Um, I could see, you know, feeding yourself to a certain point. Uh, but when you break a leg, that is, requires more than, you know, a nine or ten year old or however you were when you, how old you were when you broke your leg, um, more intervention than that. So what happened then? Well, um, when I broke my leg, I, uh, my mother considers it her rock bottom. Um, she was, um, at the time, going out every night to the bars, drinking, um, would come home very, very late at night, and uh, every morning for years, I was holding her puke bucket in the morning for her. Mm. Um, so. Of course, as a child, I saw many, many years of drug abuse and alcohol abuse. However, I, I think instinctually I knew that things were getting really bad. Um, she would be gone for weeks at a time sometimes, and she, uh, at that time, when I broke my leg, started um, doing meth. Hmm. And she stopped eating pretty much, you know, lost a lot of weight and got a whole new group of friends, started hanging out with, and um, it got so bad that she knew that it wasn't a healthy place for me or my brother to be. And So they were using around you, or she would go off somewhere else to use, leaving the kids alone? Is, what, what was happening? Um, you know, I think she always let me see a little bit more than my brother. Yeah. Yeah, my yeah. little brother has always been the one we've, tried to keep sheltered. sheltered yeah. And yeah. Um, I, as the oldest child, was the one that was taking on the responsibilities. Um, so drug use and alcohol abuse um, was something I was very used to at a very young age. Mm. And sh everyone was very comfortable doing it around me. I was, at a very young age, very mature, and um, always liked hanging out with the adults. Never had friends my own age in mm. school. Um, at recess, always stayed in with the teacher and just talked to the teacher instead of playing, you know, even in kindergarten. Mm. Um, I didn't go to much schooling. It was very sporadic. I changed, you know, and went to many, many different schools. So keeping up with the kids and social life and right. their whole curriculum yeah. was not easy for me. Right. So therefore, I tried to take on my own education and just tried to have recess time with the teachers. But, um, yeah, you know, when she hit rock bottom, she knew that things weren't getting better. Yeah. And there was no place for me or my brother to go. And um, DHS was called on my family many times for many different reasons, different neighbors, um, different family friends. For example, you mentioned a town in California. So the neighbors mm -hmm. are noticing, I mean, maybe, you know, uh, uh, it boggles the mind, you know, okay, a nine-year-old cashing social security checks. How do you pull that off? <laughs> you go to a check cashing place, you go to a bank, how does a nine-year-old do that, you know? But once you get mm -hmm. over that initial hurdle, because somebody's bound to notice mm -hmm. that, right? And, you know, how are you with, the kid pushing the shopping cart with your little brother in it, you know, making, you know, lists mm -hmm. of groceries and all of that course. kind of stuff. And I mean, we were living in a small town, and yeah. people noticed. Right, right. You know, as you're saying. Um, they, they noticed when I started calling the teachers up and asking, can you pick my brother up for school? Mm. Because there was nobody else to call. 
Yeah. You know, I had used up all the other carpooling options. And after a while, um, I, I started feeling like these people were questioning my family, you know, and starting to... And you felt protective somewhat. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, my brother probably wouldn't have gone to school if it wasn't for me. Um, being able to call up people for him to get rides. And um, a lot of people in the town were very worried about, about me and my family and my mom. So what she decided to do is she called up um, my aunt and uncle up in Seattle, and she asked them if they would take care of my brother. And um, they said, yeah. And so my brother went to go stay with my aunt and uncle for a couple years and has um, off and on stayed with them as a place for um, him to go when things have gotten bad for my mother and father okay. and when there wasn't anywhere else for him to go. Um, but she kept me there, and um, I, I wanted to stay with her, but she also kept me there because... She um, was very attached to me as a friend and as her daughter and her support system, you know? And I don't think she wanted to see me leave. She was in a really hard time in her life. She was battling um, a lot of different drugs. You know, meth is just one of them. She was also doing a lot of cocaine, as I said, drinking a lot. Um, but she, she didn't have many friends that were there for her, yeah. you know? And to send away your youngest child is one thing, but then to send away your eldest child is another, I think, right. for a parent. Yeah. Especially for my mother. You know, she had me when she was 17. We're very close in age. We essentially grew up together, you know. Um, I, I think of her as a sister, but yet she is my mother, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really feel uh, much mothering from her as a child, you know. Oh, that, that kind of follows, right, given the activities. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to, for her, I mean, if she's saying that's your rock bottom, right, so you know, she's in a better place now. I mean, still alive, not the way we usually mean better place, because... Um, so how'd you break your leg? Because, I mean, when you talk about, you know, being you know, disabled, and, mm -hmm. you know, well, that was... You know, part of your self-identification. What are the circumstances, and what happened? You know, to have because I, I take it th things didn't go all that well or optimally mm -hmm. in terms of you know perhaps a little bit of malpractice there. Right. Well, um, what happened was I I broke my leg um, when I was sledding. Mm. My I was in the back of the sled, and um, my leg got caught underneath the sled and I uh, broke the tibia. Mm. Now, there are certain places in your bone that's called your growth plate that is a softer kind of cartilage bone um, that grows and expands um, until your growth plates close and when you're done growing. Right. Um, doctors usually know to look for where your growth plates are when you break a bone, and to make especially sure that your growth plates, your age at the time especially were, right? a child okay. whose growth plates are not closed. So was mom around for that? Yes. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, however, these doctors said nothing about growth plates, hmm. about there being any sort of complications. Um, now looking back at it, we do see that that is a form of malpractice. Um, most definitely. So their solution was simply to uh, cast it up and, you know, be done with it after right. the cast was done. Right. Once they take the cast off, then you're just physical therapy for a couple of months and you'll be, you'll be great. Um, however, as years went on, I started growing and started feeling lopsided. And now um, I have, my growth plates have closed and I am finished growing. And there is a uh, three-inch leg discrepancy in my legs now because of this injury, what happened when I was 10 years old, um, as well as my right leg being very crooked. and um, To compensate, right. Yeah. And the bone, well, the bone where I broke it never healed straight. Properly, right. Yeah. Um, 
which that's a cast. Essentially, that's the purpose of a cast is to keep it straight and so it grows um, correct. You know, at this time, my mother was at a rock bottom. There was no food in the, the house, really. Um, I was very malnourished. I remember at a very young age um, rationing the food and um, I think... Because the source of income was still the social security check? Um, you know, my mother had many boyfriends that were mm. bringing in some income sometimes. She would get a job here and there. Mm. Um, but when, when I broke my leg, she was going to cosmetology school and she, um, she eventually dropped out of cosmetology school and um, she was definitely um, off, her, off the rocker, off the wagon. She um, was, uh, I think, doing a lot of different illegal um, things for income. Yeah. yeah. A wide range right. of yeah. things a young woman her yeah. age could do yeah. for drug money. Right. You know. Right. Right. You were aware of this even then, so, right. So you're still taking care of yourself, et cetera, convalescing. And OK, so that's a lot there. Um, so what are some of the challenges you face, for example, now being disabled, if you even think of yourself as disabled? Mm -hmm. right? Well, it depends on um, which disability you're talking about. Because yes, I do consider myself um, a disabled person because I'm not at my full full mobility. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I currently um, can walk. However, um, I'm going to be having surgery soon, and I will be um, unable to walk then for a while. Um, so I am um, needing surgery for my leg. Um, which is something we haven't talked about yet. Um, it's a very intense surgery that's going to be uh, consisting of a brace and... Um, a brace that's computerized that stretches your leg and straightens your leg mm -hmm, at the same absolutely, time. Absolutely, yeah. yes. The yeah. leg lengthening and straightening surgery. A lot of pain. A lot of growing, a lot yeah. of healing. Yeah. You know, and it's going to be, um, as well as physically intense, I think also emotionally, very intense to reopen that wound, mm -hmm. you know? Because mm -hmm. essentially, I mean, it's scientifically proven that we hold different energy and feelings and emotions in different places in our body, you know? Right. And um, I've had lots of different kinds of therapy on my leg. Um, this couple of times that I've had cranial sacral therapy, they've um, gotten, the, the therapist got extreme amounts of energy rushes and emotional things and started definitely picking up on this was a very traumatic hard time in your life wasn't yeah, it right and she started like without you telling without me telling anything yeah, exactly right, yeah. so that was proof enough yeah. to me you know no scientist has to tell me when I'm just laying there and this lady's feeling my leg and she starts all of a sudden feeling all these things mm. smelling um, different things mm. that were uh, that are connected to that period of time mm. when I was in my cast and yeah. when my leg was injured, you know? And what are the odds of her, she asked me... Picking up on that without you saying right. anything. Well, they right. say, scientists say, smell is one of the, uh, the, the most strong scents connected to your memory, yeah. you know? And so she started smelling nail polish. Um, and From cosmetology school or what? Well, actually, the nail polish is um, when I was... Um, in my cast and alone, we were, it was middle of winter, you know, I had been sledding, so we were all snowed in. My mom was gone for months at a time. I was co in a cold house alone with barely any food. And um, the couple of things that I did have was I had books, you know, of course, and I had music, and I had art. But um, I didn't really have many art supplies. So what I used um, for paint was nail polish. Yeah. Okay. So I painted these giant, elaborate paintings with nail polish. And I think um, that's a, 
an intense memory for well, somebody to have, yeah. you know, yeah. and an intense smell for somebody to be smelling for a long period of time yeah. while they're painting. Because nail polish is a really strong smell. Right. And, I mean, we looked down. She was wearing no nail polish. I was wearing no nail polish. You yeah. know, and but all she of a was sudden, still picking up on she that. was smelling intense yeah. nail polish. Right. Exactly. Right. You know, as if there's a sixth sense of for for picking up you know psychological smells I mean because mm -hmm. there's no obviously physical nail polish to pick up on but mm -hmm. you know it figured you know in in your experience so I mean what do you do with that sense of abandonment because I mean you know it's like you found some inner strength there you know you're snowed in for weeks at a time mm -hmm. your words right yes with you know little food and basically your recreation being music and all that other kind of stuff who wait you said there was you know is there there's power to the cabin so who's paying the electric bill that's you mm -hmm. and yeah. with a social security well, check or know, whatever checks would come in the mail different things um, and yeah either if if I wasn't able to get it cashed myself, we were living in a small town, so people knew who I was. Mm -hmm. People knew that, okay, I can give this money to her. Mm -hmm. You know, it's her daughter. Um, but I also started getting people, um, started asking people for money, yeah. too. Yeah. Um, just myself, calling them up on the phone, saying, hi, you know, this is Lotus, remember me? Um, random people around town, you know, that I we're family, friends, or whatnot, asking them, well, you know, we're, our electric is going to get shut off in a couple of weeks. Um, could you loan us $50? You know? And a lot of times someone says yes. So it, I definitely um, started having to ask those questions and um, make those things happen, or else things would have gotten shut off for right. sure. Right. With your brother still? Um, at this point, or you're alone? Yeah, I'm alone. Yeah, yeah my yeah. brother is sent away yeah. to Seattle. Yeah. yeah. So part of those challenges then are basically, you know, taking care of your own healing, taking care of your own mental health, you know, in a, a situation that, you know, is clearly, you know, yeah, I don't think abusive really takes, you know, abuse, neglect. I mean, those are the official words, but mm -hmm. it's like it's still, you know, this is happening to you. This is your life, and... You know, but it's the life that you know, so you're making something of it, Absolutely. and and forced to do that, right? And you know, and so so there's clearly you know a certain quality of spirit where, oh well, th that's just what we do. You know, we you know travel from place to place, we perform on the street, and you know, okay, I'm alone, snowed in, mm -hmm. you know, exactly. become a Picasso there's with a nail polish. There's a lot of challenges we face in or our Frida lives, Kahlo right? Or Frida Kahlo with nail, yes, right. And it's just our, our power, our control is how we react to those things that life brings us. So what are, what are some of those sources of inner strength for you then? Let's talk about that. Um, well, I think, you know, as I said, music and art have always been my inspiration, my hope, hmm. my, my meaning, my reason, you know. Um, and creative expression, dance, um, as well. Um, I think that at times um, we we are faced with a decision when we can either choose the negative path and the negative self-talk and give in to temptations and um, choose to numb ourselves because things are very overwhelming or the burden is too heavy. Well, I mean, in your case, you certainly, you know, by all ra any rational measure would have the reason given, you know, the role modeling, et cetera. You didn't. Why? I didn't give in to temptation? Yeah. Well... Well, I don't know if I could say I'm that I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt, but I mean, clearly, all right, you know, you haven't hit rock bottom. I mean, to do the things that you did, I mean, 
you don't have, this is in the therapy session, you don't have to, you know, reveal any more history than you want to and that you have. Um, but, you know, clearly, I mean, you know things beyond your age that are not certainly not taught in any school curriculum. Mm -hmm. But, you know, definitely, you know, you're a survivor and a, a survivor at an early age. Mm -hmm. And so you've gotten exposed to things that a lot of people don't get to see at your age mm -hmm. or that they only hear about vicariously. And you know, as a young child, I wondered, why is no one doing anything? If these people, DHS, Department mm -hmm. of Human Services, mm -hmm. a name that I knew at a very young age mm -hmm. to be very scared of, mm -hmm. and that, you know, if we said the wrong things to them when they asked the right questions, right. then we could be going to foster care very mm -hmm. soon. And you didn't want to do that. And I, well, you know, as much as it was unhealthy and I saw us struggling and I saw that we needed help, it's also a very traumatic thing for a child for their family to be broken up. Right. You know, we were already broken up enough. Yeah. You know, it felt like. Yeah. So I asked myself, you know, ambulances were coming many, many times sometimes uh, a month coming because my mother was, you know, passed OD'd out. OD'd or whatever. OD'd, yeah. yeah, totally. Yeah. And, um, and you found her and you, ca you called 911? Um, I never I never called 911. Hmm. It was usually her boyfriends that okay. would find her okay. and call the cops or the ambulance or whatnot. And um, I asked myself, why, why is no one doing anything? You know, they just keep asking us the same questions, you know? Um, <laughs> like what? Do you have enough food? You know, do you do you feel scared? Are you safe? Is anyone hurting you? Is anyone touching you in inappropriate places? You know, the standard questions. The standard questions, exactly. And you'd answer whatever they wanted to hear. You know, that would make them go away. That would make them go away, yeah. exactly. Okay. Whatever they wanted to hear to keep, you know. But they kept coming me. back. And so even though, you know, at the time, because, you know, we, uh, when we talked about this and, you know, in, in the kitchen that time, you know, that, okay, this is in another state, but it could be happening here. Yeah. It absolutely is happening here. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. We know this. Right. We know and that's this why for there sure. is a level seven, you know, <laughs> right. child. And there's, it's come to an extreme where it's a normal thing. Mm-hmm for us to, as a society, name somebody in dire need of help, yeah. and yet... Label them, but not give them the help. But yet say, yeah. we understand that you need help, but we don't have the help, and we, under you know, we need you to understand that as well. You know? So, you know, in life, we, we um, are faced with many decisions on which path we're going to take, and I have not always chosen the, the path of light and happiness and positivity. Um, Despite being named Lotus. Right, the, the Lotus Blossom that comes grows out, out of the, the mud. muddy, pit, yes, right. muddy pit of right. chaos. Right, right. Um, but through, through the, the mud, you go through the murky waters of struggle and of materialism and, you know, whatnot. So at a really young age... Um, I started doing drugs and alcohol um, and sell started selling drugs. I was probably 13, you know. Um, and it was, it was something that I thought was going to turn me into a new person, that mm. was going to make me have a new identity, so? a new life, a new... I thought that it wasn't just going to make my problems go away, but that... Um, that drugs and alcohol were a source of a, a new way of um, reclaiming myself in, in, in this new identity, yeah. you know? Yeah. Something I, hear, I could, I, I could I hide behind. I hear that a lot in my trade. So, yeah, yeah, right. A lot of people, you know, expect that, you know, to be, you know, to be remade, you know, or they discover a new world or you know, or the pain goes away or whatever, or mm -hmm. that, and that becomes well, their identity. Well, I thought, I really, I, I thought that the drugs weren't working at first. Mm. You know, um, I thought that, you know, you usually start smoking pot. So it was, 
not a big deal, just smoking herb. But it was still, I still had the same thoughts and feelings that I had before. Yeah. So I thought, it's not working, I need to take more. Mm -hmm. Or I need to take something stronger. Mm -hmm. So it mm -hmm. soon turned into, you know, different pills. Whose ever pills were in the house, you know? Right. Or um, cough syrup or anything, you right. know? And which soon turned into, you know, so I started, I just started doing Ritalin, which Ritalin seemed so close to Coke that, okay, mm -hmm. sure, mm -hmm. I'll snort a line, mm -hmm. you know, and, oh, but that wasn't enough. You know, it's not working yet because I'm still Lotus. I'm still got the same life. You know, I've still faced the same roadblocks. So I need to take something harder. Um, so eventually, you know, I... I was 13 and I was shooting up meth and heroin on a regular basis because finally when I got there to that point I was a completely different person and um, I was alive you know but as I look back on it those th that time is so foggy I feel like I was uh, dead yeah. you know essentially my was spirit there? was gone yeah, yeah it was here you know um, I, I felt like I was definitely you know, the open-eyed slumber, um, journeying through this Somnambulant. world. Somnambulant, yes. Journeying through this world. Sleepwalking, with, right. Mm -hmm, sleepwalking completely. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I was in Eugene, and Eugene's a good small town with a lot of very concerned people that have got your back, and uh, the school you know, started searching my locker all the time, you know, and I was a smart kid. I always knew, you know, how to hide it well, and um, the school counselor tried to have intervention after intervention with me, um, but yet I just I was in such big denial myself. I was in such a deep hole of denial. I was not anywhere in a place to say, I need help, yeah. or... I'm even making a mistake. It was something I would do and forget about immediately. You know, it's something a drug addict often does. Sure. So after years of the system essentially neglecting you or mm -hmm. asking the same questions and doing nothing, when you had somebody, you know, uh, I guess in a local school, you know, school building, you know, school counselor, as you talked about, try and do intervention after intervention. So, whoa. The system is noticing you, taking notice, and trying to help you. But at that point, you know, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, continue on in, in, in your particular, your particular path. But what did it feel like to have the system say, hey. Well, it's like the cops, you know. They're yeah. always there when you don't need them and never there when you do. <laughs> it's... Um, you know, the cops are always... There are some are people that would say that's so cynical for one so young. But, you know, that's a reality. But, yeah. That's a absolutely. reality when for I a lot of them, people. You know, there was lots of times that a cop When you have, needed them, they, they weren't there. They were not there. there. Yeah. And when I didn't need them... They were all know, over. All yeah. over. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So what was your way out? Well, I, I you know, I... I can remember a specific day when I I felt like there was a voice speaking to me that was like, Lotus, if you don't get out of this now, you're going to die. And um, I was like, whatever. I, f I feel like I'm already dead. You know? What's, it's not that, m that far away from mm -hmm. where I already am. Mm -hmm. It wasn't scary at first, mm -hmm. thinking that I was could be dead yeah, right. really soon, you know? But yet, I, I kind of woke up and I realized, wait a second, you know, I have been very, very dead for a long time, but yet I still have, I still have a future that I need to be a part of. You know, I still have people and places to be in this world. And what does that future look like to you? It looks like um, helping people. Okay. There's a lot of people that need help and a lot of injustice being done and a lot of discrimination still. 
you know, and it needs to be a step and a level we take as a society, as a collective consciousness, towards a more conscientious way of living, in a more harmonious way of living with the earth. Mm -hmm. And your and your fellow people. And taking care of our people. Yeah. Exactly. So, what does your self care look like? Well, right now, I finally. I feel like I had the time and I've had the the space, the time and the space first in my life is now um, that I've been just been able to slow down time in my life and all the things that are busy and going on, I've been able to stop and realize that most of the life that I was given was not my choice and that I need to put those things on hold and start choosing new things for myself intentionally, start reintroducing certain particular things that I'm very interested in following those paths of into my life, you okay. know? So, let's see. As you know, my daughter would say that I'm a skipping CD about this particular subject. But uh, your education, formal or otherwise, what about those plans? Well, I dropped out of school when I was um, in the 10th grade after one or two months mm -hmm. um, because my mom had gone homeless and I needed to find a job. So, you know, I've graduated ninth grade at this point. Um, for the future, I see that I am um, going to be healing people and helping people. Now, right now, I think that there's so many infinite ways that we can help people and heal people. Um, and there's a lot of different ways that I'm planning to do that. You know, absolutely. Um, after my surgery is done, I'm planning to go to massage school. Um, but that's just one way of mm -hmm. healing people mm -hmm. that I'm interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, really, it's a lifelong journey of being able to find different ways we can find fulfillment, you know. Well, given some of your experiences, they give you a wealth of knowledge that a lot of people don't have. But, you know, I mean, there are a lot of people that have been in the life. There are a lot of people your age that have been in the life. You know, it would strike me, I mean, you'll be getting a DVD of this, so you, you can see how it looks on television. But I can imagine what this looks like to a television audience to, you know, see, you know, this story. So not so casually laid out, but I mean, it's like you had stuff that is a lot of people's nightmare, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're not broken by it. Mm -hmm. So for people that are still in the nightmare who are still somnambulant or they're walking ghosts, and you know, there's a term you know, in, from Buddhism that actually you know, even works out into German. So like poltergeist is a noisy ghost, polter, noisy, right? Mm -hmm. Hungry, which is actually from German too, hungry geist, a hungry ghost, you know, from Tibetan Buddhism. It's like, oh, it's a spirit who used to be human but, you know, died and they, you know, they had an addictive personality while they were alive and now they don't have a body so they're basically, you know, trying to seek after those pleasures blindly and, you know, the image is of, you know, a giant body that's never satisfied, constantly stuffing itself, right? So you've been through that, and you're not at that place anymore. And so for mm -hmm. the people that you see your age or even older mm -hmm. that are still in that place, what would you say to them? That you have so much more power than you even know. You know, and that is the truth of the matter, is that we as human beings are in, in one way very powerless because the universe has control over what it, it throws to us, what it gives to us. You know, yet the power of manifestation brings it to another level of we are creating our own reality and our thoughts and our feelings now that we're having are creating our future. 
So I would tell them, know your power. Know the power of thought, of emotion, of feeling. Know the power of the, the, the cycle and how it perpetuates itself. You know? And know that the cycle can, can work for you and against you. So if you choose to start having a negative, negative self-talk or choose the negative path, you know, mm -hmm. then, um, then it will be so much harder to get out of it. So um, let me ask you this. There are some people who consider themselves handy, extending a helping hand that are part of religious organizations. Any of those people try and contact you because they would, you know, one, one question would be, so were you ever raised with any spiritual religious framework, you know, did you make Jesus, your Christ, your personal Savior, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what is the spiritual religious framework that you have been exposed to or that you find relevant now? Well, my name is Lotus Saraswati Dasi Brashears. Mm -hmm. um, so I was born in the Hare Krishna temple and um, was raised vegetarian. Um, and I, I'm still vegetarian and still have those beliefs, absolutely. But what that led me to is just an overall outlook of spirituality and of, of uh, some sort of belief system in between quantum physics and spirituality, I mm. guess, you know. I, um, when I was nine years old, I spent some time with the Zen Buddhists um, and kind of stopped going to school and stopped kind of doing stuff and started living out there in the mountains with them and just meditated all day long and just ate the food. and um, At nine? Yeah, at nine, absolutely. And so that was a really amazing experience. However, now... You know, I'm 17. I don't necessarily practice in Zen Buddhism, mm -hmm. but um, have definitely learned so many grounding techniques. In the, you know, during that experience, how to really ground yourself and how to breathe and meditation is and manifestation go hand in hand. You know. I know. <laughs> do they? And do the people that you encounter? And you know, will they see that? You know, with you. So, okay. Let's look at, so what do you find are your internal strengths and your internal struggles? Well, I think that go going through a large amount of trauma at a very young age, yeah. I was uh, given a very... I mean, you were born in a Hare Krishna temple, so that would not necessarily, your upbringing would not presume, you know, to come from, that, that would not be the logical outcome, right? So... Yeah. So, um, absolutely. I've, I've been given a very, very beautiful mind to be able to objectively look at my life and see it, it, see it from the outside in at times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some psychologists say that disassociation or disconnection is a, a curse, but it's also sometimes a blessing for those that are in it, you know? Well, yeah, in a Western psychological framework, disassociation, you know, oh, this isn't happening or it's happening to somebody else. But mm -hmm. being dispassionate and not attached, you know, from another framework is you're looking at it, it's part of you, mm -hmm. but you're looking at it from, oh, I see this in a larger context and there's me out here, the real me that's not affected by this drama. Mm -hmm. You know, the me that's in the dharma, if we use that term, mm -hmm. you know, dharma and drama, right? Drama, dharma. Absolutely. Yeah. Because we are not our situations. We are not our body. This is not, um, this material world is not our spiritual journey, you know, fate, our whole destiny. This is just one, one stepping stone, really. Yeah. And, you know, and... To be able to look at that um, and see that the trauma and the the dysfunctionality that I've seen and I've experienced is not me, you know. 
and that I am eternal. I am spirit. Certainly, I was, am so much stronger. Certainly, it was painful. Yes, certainly, it was painful. And I mean, if we use the definition of dysfunctional as not non-functional, but functioning in the presence of great pain, then okay, that makes you know a lot of the stuff, the ab abandonment, the neglect, et cetera, et cetera, that happened to you but it didn't destroy you and basically put you in touch eventually with a deeper understanding so so much mm -hmm. so that if i could borrow a phrase from you know one of my inputs my spiritual inputs you're not a human being having a spiritual experience you're a spiritual being having a human experience absolutely so in that 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 particular place it's easier than to say that a lot of this pain, having withstood it, having not been destroyed by it, has made me stronger thereby, or at least a deeper being than you know, any other education would be. So disassociation, I mean, you're still connected to all the stuff that happened to you, but you now it's part of a larger lesson that you can now impart to other people. Absolutely. So, how do you find the community to be supportive? I mean, your mother thought Eugene was a great, nice sounding town, but how do you find it to be? Um, well, I think Eugene's a great town. I think that it could use a lot more diversity um, in, some, <laughs> in some ways. <laughs> I uh, Do tell. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the Eugene is definitely primarily white, yeah. you know, and um, I've seen a lot more than just Oregon, so I know that it's not like this everywhere, you mm -hmm. know. Right. I've lived in L.A. Right. I lived in L.A. for a long time, yeah. and it's a different world, and um, I think that that's hurting us, that, that separation of mm -hmm. being so so primarily white right. is, is hurting us essentially well, as a community yeah absolutely it does so I mean you know, yeah we could do a whole show on that but <laughs> 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 but that's what our series is ba basically you know taking a look at um, so what are some of your joys and things you are proud of um, well I I love to paint yeah I love to paint. With absolutely. other thing, things other than nail polish other, now. Other than nail polish, absolutely. Yeah. And um, I, I, um, I guess I'm proud of most that I have fallen so many times um, and that I've hurt a lot of people and I've hurt myself a lot. But yet now, finally, you know, um, I can look back on that and see that I needed to make those mistakes to be able to to be here now, yeah, and to be able to choose um, a life leading to pot possibility and potentiality. You know, I think that we're all given the same amount of um, potential when we're born. And through different experiences, it, it weakens our confidence of our potential. But yet we're always still have the same potential. We always still can um, do anything, you know, yeah. all of us, yeah. infinite potential. I mean, your mother may have identified you breaking your leg as her rock bottom, and then you went through your own subsequent rock bottom relatively, too. Um, but having done that, then you don't have to go through it again. So you, you're, you're past that. Mm -hmm. So final thoughts? Well, I guess as a final thought, I would just like to say that um, there's a lot of problems we face as a nation, but also as a community in Eugene. We face so many problems of uh, a lot of homeless youth and runaway youth because of things like, you know, level seven kids <laughs> not having anywhere other to go right. and so they end up on the streets and they end up doing drugs and they um, end up you know completely with broken lives so 
we need to realize as a community that there is a problem and that it's all of our responsibility and that it might start out with little things like building, you know, some little girl's self-esteem, you know, but whatever you do to make sure the ones that you know and that are close to you don't end up with an unfortunate fate, you know, we need to, we need to take action now, you know. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Say your full name again. Lotus Saraswati Dasi Bershears. Ah, okay. Thank you for coming. So Thank if you, you like what you've seen, uh, email us feedback at liveclass at lanecc.edu. Uh, Lotus is actually a follow-up. Uh, when we had uh, Martin Rafferty who was talking about making a film with homeless youth, Lotus was actually one of those youth that was in that film, though you don't see her identified. We were able to get her, and so it's follow-up. So if you want more... Uh, uh, guests like that, let us know, and let us know what you know about this show. Uh, next week will be our last show for this season until the fall, in terms of live, and we'll be having Red Lodge folks. So, till then, go well, stay well. <laughs>